everybody. Uh, my name is Philip Kruger. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, thanks for the organizers for the opportunity to talk here. It's, um, it's awesome to be in Bruno, and I'm not cold at all. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, something that is my passion for the past year and a half. Um, and uh, I'm basically going to tell you a story, or my story, how did I get to um, GraphQL. Can you hear me in the back, by the way? Am I speaking loud enough? And then we're going to uh, look at GraphQL in general, uh, and then we'll look at MicroProfile, the specification, and then I'm going to show you some examples uh, that is going to run against the small RI implementation of this specification. And at any time, please interrupt me if you have a, a question. Right, so my story, and I'm, I'm hoping this will give you enough context and, and you can relate, um, because I think this is fairly similar in, in any big organization. So before I joined Red Hat, I, I worked at a big insurance company in South Africa, and uh, we did everything. We did short-term insurance, so insuring your house and your car and your, your TV and whatever, um, medical insurance or health insurance, we did uh, uh, life insurance, so payout when you die. Uh, we did some wealth management, helping you save money, um, employment insurance. And all of these business units was actually small little companies that had their own CIO, their own IT systems, kind of operating on, on their own. And then on the front end or on the, on the engagement to the client side, typically engage using a broker, and so you would deal with your broker when you uh, take out new insurance, um, or you can phone the call center, um, or you can use the website, or you can use the mobile app. And, and all of these are different business units or different teams with their own CIO and their own IT systems. Um, and where I worked was something in the middle of all of this, because Insurance companies are typically a fairly negative engagement. If you have to deal with your insurance company, something bad happened. Either you went to the doctor because you're sick, or you bumped your car, or your TV got stolen, or you died. Something bad happened, right? So our job was to make sure that the engagement with the client is positive and, and more frequent because Typically, you don't deal with your insurance company on a daily basis, so you forget about them, and then only when something bad happens, you have to talk to them. <coughs> so I worked in this department called Client Engagement Solutions, and our job was to engage the client in a positive manner. So we need to keep the client happy. And, and the way in which we've done that is we basically create the profile of this client, um, and, uh, and then we score this profile. So we would do things like um, we would understand how active you are. Um, so we would integrate with a smartwatch and, and understand how many steps do you take, um, how many calories did you burn. We integrate with, with uh, the gyms in, in the country to understand you went to the gym so you are active. Um, all sorts of very private information that, that we shouldn't really do, but, but we, we're doing it, right? So we would understand how you spend your money so that we know that you spend your money well. Um, and then we'll use that information to score you, and then because of your score, you can get discount at a shop, um, or discount on flight tickets, or at a coffee shop, or we have an online shop where you can buy stuff. This is fairly normal in South Africa. I know it's a foreign concept here, but if, if I do this talk in South Africa, everybody knows who's the company I'm talking about. Um, the, the point is that this team that, that I've worked in uh, did a lot of integration. Right, so we had to talk to all of these third-party partners and to integrate with their systems, and we have to talk to all of these to be able to integrate with those systems, and then all of these business units need to talk to us and understand the client yeah. So the point is we did a lot of integration, mainly. Now, when I started there, which is now five, six years ago, and obviously, like any big company, there's a lot of legacy. Um, so a lot of the integration actually happens with FTP. Files being dropped on some folder, and we have to pause it and pick it up on a daily basis. Um, there were some SOAP services, not really well defined. 
there's some RMI services, again, not very really well defined. Um, a big part of the system is even today still running on AS400. Um, and then there was a Java server which was by that time also created. So when I got there, um, we decided, right, we're going to be modernizing our systems. And we're going to do something which is cloud first or cloud friendly, um, API based and uh, well documented. So we came up with REX, and it's awesome, and it's going to solve all our problems. So at that time, the website team was busy redesigning their website uh, using portlets. So it's a server-side technology to, to create front ends. And we said, no problem, we're going to build you a REX endpoint, which will allow you to get the user's profile so that you can display this on, onto the website. Uh, and we will give you information about the user and about the score that we gave. Right, so that means that we need to also hit these systems to understand what did you actually do so that we can score you and, and show all of that information. Now, I'm going to show you some code. Um, it's not the real code uh, that I stole when I left the company. It's just something similar. Um, so what, what we've did, and if you, if you know JAXRS, this will be familiar, but this will be an example of a JAX RS endpoint where we just say on, a, on the GET protocol uh, on this path return the profile of that user. It's fairly simple. And, and JAX RS under the covers will make sure that the profile is being marshaled to JSON. Right, so a profile then contains basically the information about the person and the scores that we gave this person. Uh, a person uh, in this example, the person uh, is actually being fetched from some other system, uh, shared services, so it's not our system. And the score is our system, we, where we scored the person. So we just fetch these two and aggregate them, and then it's a fairly big response that we give back, because the person is, is a fairly big object. I think it was 70 plus fields just in the person object. Um, but it wasn't an issue, because the web team would go fetch all the pieces that, that they need to display out of this JSON and then render their page. So it, it, worked, it kind of worked. Everybody was happy, right? So, so the web team was happy. They went live and, and we had a, a REST endpoint. We started to modernize our systems. At that same point, the mobile team actually started up. It was, they didn't exist. And they heard about our awesome REST endpoint and they said, well, we want to also display this in the app, but we don't have the bandwidth to see that huge JSON that you produced back. Can you give us something lighter? We only want the following fields. So we said, okay, cool. Let's read page two of the REST manual and, and see what, what do we do in this situation. And, and we came across this concept of Hatios, which it's awesome. It's going to solve all your problems. So what the Hatios really say, say is, um, and rather than returning the whole JSON, give me URLs to where I can find the parts. So in our case, you can find the person there, and you can find the scores there. Which means I need to make another call to that REST endpoint to get the person, which is still too big, and then make a call to, to the scores endpoint to get the scores. So we, that didn't really help us, because we still have too much information. We're only making three calls now to get too much information. The mobile team weren't impressed. They don't want to make three calls and still have too much information. And the web team were not happy because they don't want to do the same and, and change what they already have. So what did we end up doing? Oh, wait. First, secondly, we, we thought, what about BFF? Now, this is not best friends forever. This is a, a pattern called uh, backing for front end. Um, and what that basically says is, uh, so we leave the, the web team as is. They integrate like they do currently. But the mobile team will have their own little backend, which they will use to integrate with us. And then they sanitize the data and send it down to, you know, over the, the wire to the mobile phone. And obviously, the web team is happy because there's no change for them. But the app team is not happy at all because they don't want to build backends. They maintain backends or are at all interested in doing backends. So, so we had to scratch that as well. So what we ended up doing is something like this. Right, and um, now we have a profile light, and it contains all the information that the mobile team wants. Okay, so now both is happy. Uh, we battle to sleep at night, but you know, life goes on. At that same time, 
the third party vendor that's building our online shop wants to display this information on their brand new CMS that they've just built in some JavaScript framework. Um, but they say they want kind of the same information as, as what the, the, web, uh, the, the mobile guys want, but can we add status to that? So, so it's the profile light but plus status, which means following the pattern that we've done up until now, we have to do something like this now. Right. So you, at that point, we realized this is not a scalable solution. We can't, for every consumer that wants something specific, build a, a weird little endpoint like this. Right, so then we started considering, should we do something like this, where we go back to just returning the profile, but allowing a user to pass in a query parameter, giving us the exact information that we should include or exclude, um, which could work. Um, it's very hard to describe this in, uh, when you document your endpoint, um, because how do we do an object that contains an object that contains a list of some objects and some dot notation to, to notate what exactly should we include or exclude. Um, and, and, and it's at that point that we realized we have this problem. We have the problem of overfetching and underfetching, where overfetching means that we are fetching way too much data um, that we don't need, and underfetching is we don't have enough data and I must make subsequent calls to get the data that I want. And the worst is the combination of the two, uh, like the Atios example where uh, I underfetch first and then I overfetch on the subsequent calls. And, and we knew that what's coming in the pipeline is, is all of these business units is modernizing their systems and they all want to use our new brand spanking new REST service and they all have their own little requirements. So, so and our current model is just not scalable, building a REST endpoint for, for each of these things. So back to the drawing board. Surely somebody else has got this issue. So we already looked at Hattios, we already looked at best friends forever, and we know those are not um, solutions that we can use. So what happens if you Google queryable REST? And that's how we got to GraphQL, or well, how I got to GraphQL. So it's awesome and it's gonna solve all of your problems. <laughs> so a little bit of history about, about GraphQL. It's been created by Facebook and open sourced by Facebook. Um, it's just a specification. Um, and it's published and available. It's been positioned as an alternative to REST, even though I believe that you could use the two together if, if you want to. Um, it's doing declarative data fetching, and we'll get into more details of that. Facebook specifically started uh, developing this because of the increased mobile usage that they had on their platform. And they had all sorts of, supporting all sorts of mobile phones and going forward, watches and what else um, uh, you're going to use. So um, they have a, a variety of front ends that they have to cater for that has the exact same problem that I've described. Um, what this allows them also to do is to have much, a rap, much more rapid front end developer. Because the front end developer doesn't have to go to the back end team to ask for a new REST endpoint because the, he can just query the endpoint himself. So they've been doing this since 2012, and it's um, publicly available since 2015, so it's not new anymore. So some of the benefits of GraphQL is then obviously solving the overfetching and the underfetching problem, because I, I do data fetching and I can um, only return what you ask for. Um, rapid product iterations on the front end, so development speed. And then GraphQL comes with a schema built in. So it's got types and it's got a schema where something like REST, you, you have to add that with a subsequent or another API like Swagger or OpenAPI. So if we go back to the example, and, and this is a good URL, how to GraphQL with some nice um, tutorials to, to get you through understanding what GraphQL is. But if we look at our example, what we would have to do is we would make a call to the profile server, service that will return a URL which will make a call to the person service that will return the person and then we'll make a call to the score service to return the scores, aggregate the data, filter what we don't want and display it on the screen. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. In GraphQL, what I'll do is I'll just go to the profile server, tell it exactly what is it that I want and um, the server returns the information that, that I've asked for, which means a mobile phone can now use that same endpoint, ask 
a smaller amount of data that they want, and, and the server will just return that. So this solves the problem that we had. Uh, the schema that's been generated is actually fairly readable. Um, so you can see this is an example of the schema that we're going to look at, or the example that we're going to look at. Um, you can see the type definitions of certain types. Um, you can see there's a, a method called delete person where you have to pass in an integer. It's mandatory. Um, there's a query which returns a list of people. Um, so it's fairly readable. Um, but apart from the schema, GraphQL also has this concept of introspection, where you can uh, use GraphQL to ask your server about itself. And so you can actually use a GraphQL query to say, uh, give me information about the schema and give me only the, type, the types and only the names and the description that are kind of that types, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so I'm going very fast, so we might, um, we might end a bit earlier. Is there any questions so far? Okay, so on to the specification. So uh, by now I'm sure you've all, at least at this conference, heard about uh, MicroProfile. But just quickly, MicroProfile is an, um, an open source specification for specifically for enterprise Java and for microservices specifically. It's a set of APIs. So there's an umbrella specification that contains a whole bunch of specifications and specifically targeting um, a cloud-based microservices type architectures. Um, so we are not in the umbrella yet. GraphQL is not in the umbrella yet. We are busy on a standalone, and I'll explain that a bit later. Um, and we are using CDI and JSONB, so we depend on, on those two. Um, Michael Profile is also a Duke Choice Award winner, 2018. Um, so the process of Micro Profile works something like this. If you want to start a new um, API inside Micro Profile, you first go to the sandbox where we play, and then you'll uh, play a little bit in the sandbox and create a POC or a some sort of an application that you then propose to the community and, uh, and then you get a, a yes or no. And if you get a yes, you start with creating a standalone um, specification, which is what we're busy with. So in the next, I would say, month, we will release GraphQL specification and, and then the next step would be to be included in the umbrella in one of the, in one of the releases. Uh, what does that mean? What is a a micro profile specification actually entails. It's basically the actual spec in words. So write out what this is, and we use ASCII doc for that to create then PDF or, or HTML. Um, it's the actual set of APIs, which is usually interfaces and, and annotations. Um, it's the test cases that you have to pass to be able to be an implementation of this specification. And we use test ng for that. And then it's a compatible implementation. And in our case, what I'm going to show you is, is small rye. We actually have another one um, that I'll talk about a bit later. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some examples of GraphQL um, using the small rye implementation. Any questions so far? Otherwise, we're going to end very early. Okay. So you can... Um, you can see these examples yourself at this URL. I'm going to actually show you how easy it is to get this running on your own machine to encourage you to go and play with this. Um, so I'm going, to, um, I'm going to start off by, by checking it out. Um, so I'll just quickly show you. You can go find it at, at, in my GitHub um, repository. Uh, I've tried to document it as well as I can to you know, show you how to install it because GraphQL itself, the specification or the API and the implementation is not released yet. You have to first build those, but it, it, it will do it for you. So you can, um, can you see there? Yeah. So you can clone it locally. And then, um, then you can do Maven clean install and give it a profile of install. And what this will do is it will go and fetch, first of 
uh, micro profile the specification to build the API locally so that it's available inside your local Maven repo. Um, and then it will go and fetch the smaller implementation from master and build it locally. So then after this, you actually have all the dependencies you need to run this. Right, so while this is happening, um, let's talk about the example. So in the example, I'm going to use the same example that we spoke about up until now. So we have a profile that has a person and scores, and we're going to start off with a plain old JAXRS service which again, I'm sure you know. Uh, so this is just getting the profile. So these, these two annotations is from JAXRS, and the operation is actually from OpenAPI, which is another um, specification inside MicroProfile that allows you to describe your REST endpoints, and, and which you can then use something like Swagger UI to have a nice UI to test it. Um, and, and then it doesn't do much, it, um, you, you give it a a person ID via our path, and it creates a person, um, and it gets the scores, and it creates this profile and returns it. Right. And then the GraphQL one is, is fairly similar. Right. The only difference is um, you know, the actual annotation. So in, in the GraphQL example, we'll just say, this is a query, or this is queryable, and this is the description. You don't need the description, but if you want to add the description, and the rest is fairly much the same. With the difference that now this guy becomes filterable. I can say exactly what fields on there I want. Okay, so let's see if this, so it's now built everything. Um, so now I can actually go to the example and then I'll just do a Maven. I've just run it on Thorntail. Um, And then what we have is a, a server on localhost 8080. And, and then I, I've created some test data just in memory um, using Faker, which is this library that allows you to just create this bunch of test data. So there's 100, 100 people in, in my person, person database, which is really just uh, memory. <clears throat> so w once you're here, you can... Um, you can go to the REST endpoint, which is Swagger UI, and we can test the REST endpoint. So let's say we do, uh, we find that person by ID. So we'll do person one. All right, so all that we really did was a, a get on, on, on this URL, and we hit that endpoint that, that I've shown you. And now we have this really big JSON file where I can now pick the elements that I want. Here's the scores. Somewhere there's a name and a surname and all the other elements that I might be interested in. Right. Um, I can now compare this to uh, GraphQL. So there's uh, a, a JavaScript library called GraphQL, which is um, a JavaScript front-end on top of GraphQL. Um, and this is what this is. It's just a way to, you know, to, do, to do this. So what I can do is um, I can now call profile foo. And as you can see, I, have, I actually have insight into um, what what can be done because of introspection. So this GraphQL JavaScript is actually using the introspection to be able to build this front end to give you this code insight. The difference now is that I can say, right, I only want the person back and I only want name and surname. Um, okay, let's say just that. And then I want the score back and let's say name and, and value. Right, so now I only get back what I asked for. And uh, that's just by adding that uh, at query annotation on my method. Right, so what we want to make sure happens is that what if the query doesn't contain the score? And, and maybe your score system is very slow. And I don't want to penalize a specific query by going to score if, if you didn't ask for score, right? So what, what I want to get right is if, if the query don't contain score, don't actually do sc the score. So I want to remove this part here um, so that this doesn't ha happen all the time. And I can do that so I can stitch things together by doing something like this where I now give it a source. And because the source is linked to what I return here, scores will be an, a field on profile now and it will only be called when <coughs> scores is one of the parameters that the, the fields that the, that the person asked for. 
So what this allows me to do then is, so let me show you the log file. So here's the log file. We'll clear it a bit. And now I'll do um, a profile. Again, we'll do person, person ID, let's do two. And uh, I want back the person. We'll do names again, surname, and scores, and names, and value. Right, so exactly the same what I've done now, just a, a different person. And, and I got that back. In the log file, you can see that both of the methods have been called for person two. So I got the scores and I got the person. If I th now change my query to not include the scores, I don't want to make a call to the score server. Right now, I only get back the person data, and I, I, I didn't make the call to scores, which could have been an expensive call. So now that we know that this is possible, Well, so, so, no, you're not calling it. Yeah, you, you're leaking it because of this. And, and you can obviously create fairly complex graphs now because you can do something like this, which is a good or a bad thing depending on, on how you look at it. Um, but as with any of, any of these, even JAXRS, uh, because it's annotation based, um, you never make the call to, to even this one, right? Uh, somewhere in, behind the scenes, usually with reflection, this, this gets called. Um, the only difference is we now know that, oh, well, we also need to pull this one and merge the data. And, and now that we know that, we realize that we actually don't need this object at all. Because all that this object does is exactly that. It's, it's binding two things together. So, so we can get the exact same effect by just uh, using these two. And there's no field on the Java object here called scores. I only add it to the boundary right at the end. So now I can do something like this, right, where I, I, I return a person, um, but I can add the score field to person on the boundary, only on GraphQR, not in Java. So a person doesn't know about scores at this point. Right, so if we look at this as an example, I can basically do a pers uh, person. This an ID three, and <coughs> we'll do names again and surname. But now score is actually a field on here. It's not a field on on profile. Profile doesn't really exist now. Uh, okay, and scores I have to say what I want back, name and value. Right. And, and similarly, I can obviously remove this if I, if I don't want that call to happen. Yeah, so far so good. So obviously one of the other things that you can do is, is a collection of something, like a list of people or a list of persons. And, and this is, a, for me, one of the bigger benefits of using GraphQL over REST, because if you think that that one person of 70 fields was big, try returning a list of 100 people and see how big your response becomes then. And, and all that you want is the, is the name of, of the person. So if, if we look at something like this, I, I'm not even going to do it in REST because it's just too big. But I can do something like this where I can say, give me people, but only their surname. Right. So now this can be fairly big but I can actually tell it exactly what I want, which I think is a, a huge benefit. Okay, so up until now we've done um, queries mostly. We're just asking for data and filtering exactly what we want. Uh, what about changing data, uh, which has been called mutations in, in GraphQL? So, so in CRUD operations, everything but the read part is a mutation. Create a new person, update the person, or delete the person. Again, very easy to do in, in MicroProfile GraphQL, annotate with at mutation, and you're done. 
Um, but the difference now is that we have a person object coming in. And in GraphQL, we, um, we distinguish between an, a type as an output type and an input type. Even though it's the same type in Java, both this person, in GraphQL, there will be a person input and a person output, well, or a person. So um, to show how we can add a new person, I'm going to just copy and paste from here. So all, all of these examples I'm showing is actually on, documented on here as well, so that you can go do this at home. So I know you want to. Um, let's close this one, close this one. Right, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, let's create a, a person. I'm only going to give it a name, Philip, and then I say I want the ID name, surname, profile picture, and website back. So if I do this, I will go create it. Obviously, all of those values are null because I didn't set them. Um, but I can now update it because I have an ID now that's been generated by the system for me. I can do an update, which is, again, just a mutation. Right, and then I can update the data. So, so we can do normal, and then delete obviously is, um, is, is fairly simple. Uh, I have a specific delete method which you can just pass the ID in. You can delete fields by setting them to null on an update, and then the field will be deleted. In this case, I'll just delete the user we just created. So I'm returning that same object back, but if I do it again, it's now been deleted. Right, so full-blown full CRUD operation. Okay, the other cool thing that, uh, that I think is a big disting distinguisher between this and, and JAXRS is how errors, errors are handling and handled and specifically uh, partial responses. So there's two types of errors. One is a validation error when you do something like this where you actually do a query that's not valid. Right? There's no such field like this, so this shouldn't work at all. And we can show that quickly by just doing something like, let's just do people, um, and we'll say give me the names and blah, which is not a field, so it, it should fail immediately. Right. And this fails even before it hits your code. So before, it, before our implementation makes the call to your annotated method, we fail and say that this is not valid. Right, validation. So that's the first type of error uh, that you can get. Um, the second one is, uh, is something like this. So I had to hard code it in to simulate a failure. So what I did is I added another source element uh, and I call it scores2. Um, and then I just throw a, a normal Java exception just to simulate this error. But this wouldn't be the source system is down or there's some error in, in your code. So if we go back to the example. So let's do, um, let's do person again. And we'll say where person is one. And return names, uh, surname, and then score. And scores name and value, as an example, right? So this works. And now something happens with the score system. So now suddenly it's down. So to simulate it, we do scores two. Right, and now I get a partial result back. So we give you what we can, which is the person. And then we say, then this is the error for, for, for scores. And you can even go line, at line 5 and column 5, which will go straight there where, where, the, where the error is at. And depending on how complex your graph is, you can have multiple errors. Right? So, but, but you can at least recover a little bit. So if this was a mobile phone, rather than just crashing the whole thing or showing a, a oops a web page or page, you can show some of the data um, and some not which I think is, is fairly handy. Any questions? Anybody? No? OK, so obviously, uh, you can build fairly complex graphs, like I've mentioned. Um, so we've shown how you can tie these two together. But obviously, you can tie this together, or you can tie more things to person. And you can build a fairly complex graph depending on your needs. 
Whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, that's up to, to you and, and your design. But as an example, to just show how you can do a source of a source, um, if we say that a score is being made up of a bunch of events, like you went to the gym and, uh, and you took 5,000 steps and whatever else you did, and maybe we want to display how we got to the score as well onto the screen, then event can become uh, a source onto score. So we can do something like this, where we say, uh, we have a person, we want to add scores to that person, and we want to add uh, events to scores. Right, and you can see how you can build fairly complex stuff now. So we can now do something like this, where we'll say, um, we'll go back to score, and then here we want to say, well, actually add, add the events that made up the score. Give me the action, the date and time, and the value. Right, so now, now I get more back. And again, if I don't add events, that method wouldn't have been called. Right. So what we've done in the specification as well is we've, we've said we want to support JSON-B annotations because people are no, used to it. Um, it's been supported in JAXRS. So you can do something like this where you format the date as an example. Right, so back in this example, I, I have another field now, which I, is also a local date time. I call it when, and then I said format it in this way. And so if I, if I rather use when here, then the date is nicely formatted. Right. And similarly, um, uh, all the other annotations. So I can do number formatting. So in this example, this is a salary. Um, and uh, so it will show the, the currency sign here based on ENZ, so South African Rand. Uh, and then I can actually use JSONB property to change the name. So if I don't want to use salary in the GraphQL schema, I want to use monthly salary, I can change the name. Uh, I can ignore something. So if, if I have a field in Java that I don't want in GraphQL, I can do JSONB transient. Um, and then depending on where I place this annotation, it will apply to either both. If I put it on the field, it will apply to both output and input object. If I put it on the getter only, it will only apply to output, and if I put it on the setter, it will only apply to input. And, and that's how most of the annotations work. If you don't want to use JSONB, uh, you can use the GraphQL annotation as well, so it's, it's very similar. You have an at name, which, will, which you can rename the field. You have a number format that works exactly the same, and you have an at ignore, and a date format. The reason why we, we, we wrote our own annotations is the JSONB annotations, you can't do something like this, which we also want to support. Where I want to say, actually, on this list, actually support number formatting for the big decimal inside the list. So you can do that as well. Um, we have an, a non-null, and so you can make something mandatory by doing that. The schema will actually mark it as mandatory, so it will fail in a val validation error if it's, if it's not there. And then you can do something like this, which is quite interesting. So you can say that the list itself can be null, but the elements inside the list cannot be. Or you can have a not null on, on there that will make both of them not null. Then we have something like a default value. So if you have a query that says, find me all the people with this surname, but if you didn't pass a surname, just return everybody that surname is Kruger. You can do something like that. Some other annotations that I'm not going to go into too much detail in is, is these four, um, which is really describing the, the types that we have in GraphQL. Type is just the output type. Um, an input is the input type. An enum is an enum, right? So gender, male, female. And then you can have interfaces as well. You don't need this because when, this, when the system starts, we will look at all your queries and mutations, look at the response objects, look at the parameters, and build it based on that. But in case you want to have specific behavior, like as an example, um, have an interface um, but in GraphQL, but if an actual class in Java, then you can mark it as at interface. You can rename it the type name. Otherwise, we'll just use the class name. 
And then add source that, that, that I've already shown you. That's how you can tie things together. And then the last demo um, is to show you introspection, which is also very cool. So it's a way to use GraphQL to look at the GraphQL schema. Um, so by default, the schema will be created based on your annotations. So as the system startup, we'll scan the annotations and build the schema and make the schema available. The schema is available under a URL. You can go and download it. Um, but in this case, you can also then use introspection. So you'll see here in, in, this, in this little front end, you can already browse it here. And that's because of introspection. So I can actually see all the field sets available. I can go into people. I can s exactly see what a person looks like. You know, addresses. There's a list of, of um, line items. But just to show you how you can do this here, um, so I can say, show me the schema, show me all the types, only show me the name and the kind, right? And, th and then I can get it back. So that's pretty cool. OK, so at the moment, uh, there's two implementations. Smaller is the one that I've shown you now. It's the example ran on that. That's the one I'm working on. It's nearly spec compliant. Um, for the past two months, it's nearly spec compliant. Uh, and then Speaker is a, is a library that you can see there. And, and that's a library that existed before we started this process. And a lot of the concepts in here is, is based on what was available in that library. And the author of that library is also on the working group of, of the spec. And that's me. So if you have any questions, please ask now or find me afterwards or online. In my example, not really, because, because my data is in memory. So depending on, on how you fetch your data, yes. If you make every field a separate source, and, and then your queries can become very expensive. And there's some articles online that explain that problem exactly. You can build a very complex system that is fetching data all over the place. But if I ask for everything, then it's going to be slow. Um, the slowest thing in your system is the network. And this is what we're trying to op optimize here. Yeah. So wh what we'll add in potentially um, in version 1.1, because we can't get it into one, uh, because we have to release. But there's a concept of um, um, a context. So what you will have is the ability to inject the context of the original query or question mutation anywhere in the code. And if you, as an example, fetch from a relational database, you can first inspect the context. And then you can base your SQL or the way in which you put it on that. So if it's a complex join or something, you might be able to optimize the way you fetch the data from the database and if you want to. And that, but, that will be in the uh, 2.0 version? And 1.1, yeah. 1.1. Yeah. So 1 is going to release in the next month, I would say. Um, and the implementation shortly after. And then we'll start. It's, it's, it's on our issue list, right? Yes. So let's go there and then, yeah. Um, can you be a graph where that uh, some people are allowed to see some of the fields yes. and some people are allowed to see the other fields? Yes, so authorization. Right. Yeah. Authorization is on our one point one. So all, <laughs> so all security <laughs> type stuff is, is on there, right? The security is one of the more difficult things in graph field because we only have one input. And, and with this, you, you typically secure your inputs. And you say, oh, you're allowed to get this endpoint. But you're not allowed to use this input. We have rock here, you have one input, and you can ask questions. So, so we have to still find a clean way to do authentication with some sort of. We'll possibly just use the annotations that's available in the security API, but a way to tell yeah, can you see this data or not? And then you can either have an exception and then do partial responses where you can say, well, you don't have, you don't have, you can't see this field because of you know, authentication there, but here's the stuff you can see. That's I'm thinking out of the box how it will work. We haven't fine tuned that yet, but, but yes. Security is a, is a difficult thing in the world, more difficult than in the rest. 
but we don't like it easy. And then you had a question? So you were already answered because I wanted to ask if it's the only one endpoint for the server. Yeah. So yeah, this is at this point, um, my, again, maybe in the future, if, if there's a requirement to be able to have more than one endpoint, then, then we can build it into the specification. Or if you want something like you already have a schema and you want to just merge it with the one that, well, that we generate or something like that, we'll, we'll have that. Uh, when do you expect that specification will come under the umbrella of the I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't guess a date. I get dates wrong all the time. So we would have released by in December last year. Obviously, we didn't. Um, I think the process of microprofile is kind of prove yourself as a standalone, see if there's interest. And if there is, which I hope there is, um, then it will be included. I personally think this is a much better way for microservices to talk to each other, a much more network optimized way to talk. Um, but we'll see how, how the community. Okay, then, then, then. So, I, I have to worry about which one was secret as well, like uh, I've seen uh, a little reception uh, strings, uh, sometimes it's desirable to have them here for. Yeah. So, what we have in the spec, so let me just repeat the question so that I understand. Make sure I understand. <laughs> That we can uh, we can provide compromising data in the exception message that we pass to the response, and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, what the spec says is that the runtime exceptions we will not pass back. We will we will configure a generic message that says this has happened, uh, you know, Google has happened, and only if you really want that to go back to the client, you can use uh, Microsoft for config to set a config. Say so yes, this is fine. And then vice versa for check exceptions. So by <coughs> check exceptions, you can say, well, this is a business exception, so this is normal. We'll allow that, but you can you can blacklist it. So you have a white and a blacklist for runtime or not. That that's already in version one. Does it also support other JSON libraries, library checks? No. No. So if it's the JSON B that, that you use under, under, underneath uses uh, Jackson, then, then yes, but the spec itself, we don't want to tie ourselves from a spec point of view to a library. Uh, speaker, the, the, um, the other implementation supports uh, Jackson and GSIN. But uh, that's a good and a bad thing. Like it, it makes the code very complex to try to figure out which one you use, and um, you know, we want to promote coding against the specification. Any more questions here? Yeah. And then there? Is there a way to search for everything? Personally? Yeah. Include all the fields. <laughs> every field? Yeah. And, and every score, uh, for example, and every event? Yeah. And, and that's why this is also an API that makes it easier to, to add a new field as an example or remove a field without breaking anything. So, so version includes. Versioning is less important than it is with REST, as an example. Yes, there was another question there, first one. Uh, can you show any of those several slides that you had a annotation for? Where are you Just uh, which, which one? I think the previous one. I think the previous one. This one? No, no, they, they, you have to keep going up. Okay. More? That one. Yep. Uh -huh. Because I wanted to ask you about how, two things, how you do uh, search, like if you wanted to not get all the people that are involved to search on the library set. Yep. And the other thing which is related is how would you do something like pagination, for example? Yes. Like you only want the first point to be So, So both of those will just be a query. You'll have to still write it. So you will say, what is searchable fields? Searchable will be some input object that you can get in. I can get the fields in. Graph, the graph the like that doesn't take care of how do you actually search your data, that's, and how you persist your data, that's your problem. But you can build the API to make the searchable input and do it. Pagination, similarly, what we'll do with pagination is, um, again, version 1.1 or maybe even 1.2 pagination, but um, maybe add an annotation that you say this is pageable. 
something like that, and then we will do that for you. But already you can do it by manually adding pagination. I have an example, so I'm going to pick up that add pagination. Any more questions? No? If you do have more questions, please find me either here or online.